Thanks, Eric. All right. So I'm going to start with Pathfinder Office. It's either on the start menu under Trimble, all programs, Trimble, um, and it's called GPS Pathfinder Office. And it's this old looking uh, computer with a Windows icon on it. I also have it on my desktop as a shortcut. So GPS Pathfinder Office looks like an old computer with a map of the globe on it. I'm going to start this up. Whenever we start Pathfinder Office, it always starts up with the last project used. Um, in this case, I had one started last Wednesday for your group here. Uh, if you want to create a new project, I'll just do that real quick so you can see. Click on new. I'm just going to call it Eric Test. What happens is the software creates a project folder. In my case, the default is uh, my user account, Eric, documents and settings, and then uh, or my documents, I should say, GNSS projects, and it grabs whatever project name and puts it right here. Underneath this main folder, it's going to create three other folders, backup, uh, export, and the base folder. You can modify this location at any time if you need. Some people like to save the data on their servers, so they make a default project folder on their server called Trimble Projects or Trimble GNSS, and then the data gets stored there. Um, I typically like to put mine straight on the C drive instead of the user's my documents, but is where it's at right now but you can you can definitely change where you want that i'm going to click ok and everything looks right here it has the project name i'm just going to hit ok uh, just to kind of go over we're, we're going to go back into that project folder to look here in a second but i'll briefly talk about the tools so across the top is basically all the tools um, file basically lets you open change projects add in background maps like uh, raster images or shape file or things like that uh, waypoint files edit we will mess with the edit menu uh, after we process the data view is where we turn on all our screens we'll come back to this in a minute um, data has a couple other screens that we're going to turn on utilities is pretty much where everything happens in our software uh, batch processor this is this is a utility that you can basically link uh, data transfer differential correction export into a little model and then you run the model instead of doing these individually uh, and it just does everything for you um, we're going to go through doing each one separately at the end maybe today or probably on the Wednesday call I could show a sample batch processor it just speeds up your field processing quite a bit the first session we did last week was a data dictionary editor that's found under utilities. There's another one here called TerraSync Studio. This software allows you to customize TerraSync a little bit. You can put your own like little logo on the splash screen that only pops up for five seconds or something. You can turn off uh, features in TerraSync that you may not want to use like navigate, waypoints, uh, things like that, settings. Imports, how you bring data in. So if you have existing shape files or uh, Google Earth files or file, file geo database that you want to bring in, you can import that data. All of these tools also show up right here on the left side of my screen. It might be kind of hard to see, but this is the batch process, or transfer process, export. Under options, here's where we set up our units. I'll go in here right now. Uh, defaults for the software is meters. Um, I have my precision set to inches right now. We're going to switch this to feet. Um, click OK on that. We have coordinate system settings. Uh, the default out of the box is latitude, longitude. You can change your height measurement if you want. You can change your altitude measurement if you want. So that's all in here. And let's see, style of display, that's basically the main thing in here is uh, if, if you do use lat-long coordinates, you can change from degrees, minutes, seconds to decimal degrees 
or if you want to use decimal minutes. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, that's really about it with our software. There's not a whole lot in here. Um, what I will do now is with the, on the, the second toolbar, if you go all the way to the right, you'll see that project I made called Eric's Test. And next to that is a, a yellow folder with a globe in it. I'm going to click on this. Here's those backup base and export folders that it made for my project. Right now, they're all empty. Um, so that's kind of what it did when we when we made a new project. What I'm going to do is go to this project changer here, and I'm going to go all the way to the top. And I'm going to grab the Atlanta training, and now I'm going to click on this folder, and you'll see I have a few things in here. Uh, on the Monday session previous, we created a data dictionary file. Um, it's a very it was very generic, but we just kind of created some some uh, plant features point feature, point feature, a waterway feature, and an area feature. And on each one of these, I went through and made like pick lists, numeric attributes, uh, time and date and photos. So that's all on that first training video session is going over this. But that's what the data dictionary file looks like. So basically, I have a project set up. What I'm going to do now is we're going to transfer in the data that we collected last week. So I went to utilities and I chose that data transfer icon. My, I'm running a Trimble Geo 7X right now. It is plugged in with a cable. Uh, the Geo is powered on. It's connected to software called Windows Mobile Device Center. Um, this is the software that allows the communication between the Windows mobile application and my Windows, I think I'm running Windows 7 on my machine. So that's how they communicate. If you don't have this software, uh, you can use an SD card to transfer. Um, I have settings for that. A thumb drive, you can, you can set up folders to do that. It's basically you just create a new device. If that's something y'all want to look at, maybe we could do that on the Wednesday session. Um, so right now it says connected GIS data logger on Windows Mobile. It says right here that's connected. If I hit the little red X, that basically connects or disconnects. If I hit the green check, it connects it back. If you ever get to a spot where it tries to connect, so I just unplugged mine. If you get in here and it just says connecting, connecting, and it never connects. Um, basically, what I would start is make sure the USB cable's plugged in, make sure the device is turned on. So I'm going to plug my Geo back in. It's going to take a second, but it'll eventually connect here. There we go. So it's definitely connected now. Um, we have two tabs for data transfer. When you're bringing data in from the field, we want to click on the receive tab. Uh, if you're sending data to the device, you would click on the send tab. Did I say send twice? I might have, sorry. Uh, well, now I'm on the send tab. Uh, if I want to send like a data dictionary file of it, we could do it this way. If I had an existing data file or maybe an imported file that had maybe some boundaries of a, a, a forest unit or a study area that you were going to go look in uh, or some waypoints, we could load all these different things in here. Maybe an updated image of the area you're gonna go visit to collect data in. That would be under background. These are the most used though, the data file, data dictionary, waypoint, background. This other stuff, not so much. So we're gonna go back to receive. And now I'm gonna, we only have two options here. You can download a waypoint file or a data file. In, my, in most cases, you're gonna grab a data file and then this new screen pops up. So in this screen, anything that hasn't been transferred shows up highlighted in blue. So I have two files here that I created. Uh, these are probably for a friend of mine. Uh, Anders was a project we worked on. We haven't transferred it yet. Uh, the ones that we're working on last week were these ATL training. So I had already transferred them at the end of uh, session two. So we're actually just going to open them both. You can grab, you can select all if you want. 
they are data files they are being transferred to my Atlanta project. I'm just going to hit open and I'm going to hit transfer all. And you'll notice here it's going to transfer a file, it's going to transfer the second file, and then if I took any photos, you'll see that it's going to transfer photos after that's done. So there goes one of the image. At the end, um, should be successfully transferred. There are times when a file can get corrupted and the transfer may not work. In that case, uh, you basically call us up, I get the raw data files and I can get them fixed. Corrupted data files come from maybe the unit was on in the field and it was powered off accidentally or the battery died, shut down improperly. Sometimes it writes a dummy record and basically we have to fix that file and send it back to you. So if you ever have one that hasn't successfully transferred, don't go reshoot the data, send me the raw files and we'll get that fixed for you so you don't have to go and redo it. When I'm done, I'm going to hit close. And here I always get in the habit of hitting disconnect and then I close it out. Uh, I've had it in the past where I've just closed it out without disconnecting and then sometimes the GPS uh, doesn't like to connect back. In that case, I just restart the software and it works. Okay, since the file has been transferred, we are going to open that up. So I'm going to click on File and Open. Now we're in my project folder. We have two files here, and I'm just going to select this top one, ATL Training Test. Um, it tells me the data dictionary that was used when it was created. It gives me the start time. So this one was on uh, December 4th. It was about a 15, 20 minute file. I'm gonna click on the second one here. Uh, this one was a little bit longer, had some more positions, let's see. Okay. So we'll start with the first one. Yeah, this is the one I collected with the real data. Um, the, the second one was during your previous training session where I had an antenna on the roof. And uh, the data was collected, but it's all in the same spot. So we're going to go with this first one. So I'm going to click on File and Open. So out of the box, no windows are turned on. So the data file is open, but we're looking at a blank screen. So um, I'm now going to click on the View, and I'm going to turn on Map. So now we see the Map View. I'm going to click back on View. And I'm going to turn on this timeline. And then I'm going to go over to data. I'm going to turn on one called feature properties and then data position properties. Now, the first time you do this, the map may come in and it may take up the whole screen. Or maybe you have two computer screens. You can move these windows around. I just like to get them to where they kind of all fit on the screen. All of these windows are going to be linked up when we start looking at the data. So that's under view, map, view timeline, data, and feature properties and position properties. That's the long way. The shortcut is basically right below the word view. You see this little flag that turns the map on and off. Got the timeline, turns on and off. Same for the feature and position properties. So if I close out the software, restart it, it'll remember the windows that were open. So I'll just redo that. It's gonna ask me what project I wanna open. I'll say okay to that. My windows are back where they were, the file is closed, so I'll open that back up. And now we should see some of my data. Um, are you are you all, you should, I hope y'all are seeing the screen. I didn't uh, ask that before we started. <laughs> I'm guessing we're good. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> okay, good. I just wanted to make sure <laughs> um, everything is good. Thank you. All right. So what I'm going to do now is, so this is kind of in the in my neighborhood. So I work out of the house. Um, so my office is basically my front and backyard. So this is, uh, we'll, we'll be able to see the streets and stuff in a little bit. But I basically created um, some prayer plant we had just made a basic data dictionary just to see kind of how everything worked so I select in my timeline here I selected the first feature
feature I shot in. It also puts a box around that feature in the map. And then on the right side here, let's make this a little bigger. We have information that I collected about this rare plant clumping feature. Um, we had basically made it just very simple. The family species, a uh, number of flowers, notes, the date and time, and then we had some photos. In this case, I didn't collect a photo on that. Under position properties, this just tells me information about how that point was collected. So it gives me a coordinate, that long. Um, my height is in MSL of minus 15. I know I'm not that far below sea level. <laughs> um, if I go down here, I see December 4th. It started collecting data at 9.40, 36 seconds. I averaged 12 positions. So when I was standing at this particular, in this case, it was a tree. Um, when I was logging that in, I sat there and let it average for 12 seconds. So I didn't move the GPS unit while I was averaging. My estimated horizontal precision is 20 feet. Now the reason it's that far off is because that is raw GPS. So it says here 3D uncorrected. That means um, I didn't have any corrections with with raw GPS or uncorrected data, they call it autonomous data, the accuracy can be up to 30 feet off. Typically, it's more around 5 or 10 feet. As the signal comes from the satellite, from the GPS satellite to your receiver, uh, it gets bounced around in the atmosphere, causes a delay. That's what causes issue with time and position. There's a few other factors as well. So we clean that data up, which we're going to do in a little bit, to get that accuracy more in line with the accuracy of the device. In the case of mine, it's around a, either a subfoot or centimeter device. Some other tabs in here, just for your reference, um, the 68 precision. So Trimble specs all their gear at 68 precision level or RMS. Uh, we have the option under here to go to uh, units. You can change that confidence level to 2D RMS if you want. Um, basically, that just means if we shot in 100 points, in this case with 68 precision level, 68 would fall within that range of the estimated accuracy. Tremble is, uh, the data is usually better than what they expect. The other tab here is DOPS. This just tells me all the satellites that I was using at the time of data collection. And my PDOP ranges, these are just ranges about how accuracy, the, how the data is made. PDOP just stands for position dilution of precision. We have a horizontal DOP, we have a vertical DOP, and we have a time DOP. Uh, in the past, before we had this thing called estimated, or estimated accuracy as horizontal precision, um, we went off of PDOP or HDOP. Anything below six meant that the position was a good one. <clears throat> All right, let's go dig around in here a little bit more and find the one with the photo. So this second one here, I clicked on it. It has a photo. I'm going to go to my attributes tab. I'm going to click on open, and you'll see just the pictures and plants in the yard here. So the the photo is going to be linked to this feature. So when I send it over to Esri, it'll have a hyperlink. Um, and we can change that hyperlink location around. Right now, when we did data transfer, it moved uh, this this file and, and it created a file path here. C uses Eric documents projects and it put it in this Atlanta project. But it also put all the photos in this squiggly line files folder. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to our folder. And you'll see here for this training test project, there is a training test folder and all the pictures are in there. There's one in here for the second project. Oh, that's when I was inside. Um, so those photos are transferred over and linked to the project. Let's go open this folder here, picture here. Um, this picture is actually, if we go to details, 
it's geo-referenced. This is called the EXIS header. So the photo has this header in it, and inside of it, it's going to give us some GPS information, latitude, longitude, elevation. When we go to process this, um, it's going to actually change this location to actually where the feature is. This latitude, longitude right now is when I was standing. I was standing away from the feature a couple of feet, maybe five, ten feet before I collected the point. So this coordinate is of that. But we want the picture to be tied to where I actually shot the GPS in. So the software Pathfinder Office is automatically going to move this coordinate once we process it um, to the correct location. So that's just if you ever needed, if you ever need a watermark, a photo, uh, you can do that with uh, software, and it just grabs that information here. We can also do it on my geo. I can turn it on the watermark, a photo in the field with date time maybe the bearing that the GPS was sitting in, things like that. So we will talk a little more about photos when we get into export, but I just wanted to show that they're there. Let's look at a line feature. So here's a line feature. This is that big long one here, just basically walked around the road trying to make it look like a stream. Um, I didn't put any attributes. Let's say uh, I came back to the field and I forgot to name this. I can just call it, I'll just name it my street. Um, you can you can make changes to the file here and then I can save them. Uh, so you can edit. If I had that photo, I could attach it as well. Um, I don't like to edit the GPS positions at this time because we're going to process and it may clean up some of these weird lines um, that may not be there normally. So like here on this blue one, it's got some weird lines here. When we process, it's probably going to smooth this line out. So we're going to save that for processing. All right, just some, some tools here. I have a select tool that's under the help menu. There's an, a ruler. There's an eraser. We're not going to mess with that right now. Zoom in is basically you draw a diagonal as long as you don't let up. You can draw a box. And I'm happy I let go. Uh, zoom out is the circle with the minus. Equal sign zooms to full extent, and then you got an undo button. Go back to the last one. So those are the tools that I use mostly. If I wanted to measure, click on one and click on the other. And uh, at the top here, it says it measured 89. That's not right. Let me go back and figure that out. Should have been more like that. Oh, sorry. It's showing up at the bottom. I was looking at the wrong one. That's just my zoom scale. Way at the bottom, whatever I'm measuring, it shows up. Uh, distance bearing. If, if I were to draw an area, it would give me all that information. So. The measure tool stuff shows up at the bottom left corner. Kind of hard to see on the screen there. This screen is just a, a zoom level that we're at. Okay, so that is kind of the basics of navigating around the software. I select anything in the map, it selects it in the timeline, as well as my other screens. We are going to go into post processing. So I'm going to start by clicking on utilities and differential correction. Some notes about differential correction. Um, we are going to be using base stations from NGS mostly. So I'm just going to type in cores just to show you a map. Now, Georgia has a shortage of base stations, it seems like, over the last few years. We have other ways to process data, but when we look at the map here in a minute, we're going to see kind of a gap in Georgia. Sure, why it's doing this. Let's 
Well, maybe their site is down. Try it again. All right, we'll look at their beta map. All right, so they must have changed it to where it'll just zoom in as you uh, pop up as you zoom in. So here in Louisiana, I have enough. Uh, I've got some stations around where I was working. This is the one we're going to use for my data. Is this um, one from LSU? It's run by our university. It's over here on Tulane's campus. If I click on, oh, that's interesting. Typically, if you click on Get Site Info. It'll pop up information and show you what the site looks like. We'll bring up the other one so y'all can see a base. But let's go over to Florida. So y'all have a project area, I think. Y'all are somewhere, I think it's somewhere around in here, one of these areas. Anyway, the base stations that you all would use would be. Um, this Crestview station. Another one that can be used as a station. I don't know if this one's here after that hurricane. Uh, we'll see if it's still good. Um, this Florida station here, but there's a few. Uh, and depending on the accuracy you need uh, or the GPS accuracy, you know, with, with a submeter unit, you could go about 150 miles and still process off of the base station. Uh, with a subfoot unit, you don't really want to go over 80 miles, 50 miles probably. And then a centimeter unit needs one fairly close, you know, 15, 20 kilometers. And then we go over to Georgia and notice that there's a, oops, there is a little gap of stations. It's not as populated as it used to be. A Trimble operates a network in Georgia um, and in Mississippi, you see kind of the same thing. They operate a network that runs basically from Mississippi over to Georgia down into Florida. At that network, you have the ability to grab stations and you have to manually download the data, but you can actually get data. So depending on where you're working, um, if you're working up here uh, in northeast Georgia, you may need if the station is too far away, this one in Gavin. Um, you can we can get you some files for, for a closer station. Anyway, we are going to process using these base stations. So, what we have here is the differential correction screen. And what I'm going to do is just have this as the only screen up right now. Uh, it, it, it grabs the file that you have selected. If you don't have anything in here, you can hit the plus sign. You can add in a second one if you would like. I typically do them one at a time, but let's say you have a group that you the files that you collected within a week, you can select them all. Uh, anything spanning longer than a week, I typically uh, split them up. Uh, let's see, so this was December 4th. It started basically um, 9 a.m. and I finished before 10. It collected 311 positions. This was collected with a H star unit as well as a centimeter unit. So uh, this is the kind of information screen. The main thing to watch out here is you don't want to go straight from the field and try to process right away. Uh, these stations, they grab the data every hour. So from, let's say right now, uh, 1 o'clock here Central Time. If I work from, let's say, 9 o'clock this morning and I ended at noon, well, let's say I ended at 1, or 1.30. Well, let's say I ended at 1. Um, the files, well, let's say I ended at 1.30 since we just started here. Yeah. Let's say I ended about 15 minutes ago. We just transferred the files in. That data for this last, you know, from 1 to 1.30 hasn't, hasn't been made available yet to download. So if you try to process too soon, it downloads an empty file. And it'll give you, um, in this case, if I had half my data that I collected before one and then the last, let's say I shot 30 features total, the last 15 I shot in the last 30 minutes, it wouldn't process half that file. So we typically recommend waiting 
at least an hour. Uh, really, the all the NGS stations, every hour they go and pull the files. They run a little program on them, clean them up, and then they make them available about 15 minutes after the hour. So just kind of be aware of that. Some people just wait the next day process. I'm going to click on next. Uh, we just stick with the default here. Automatic carriers are processing type. We don't really want to change that. Uh, then we have, if you have an H-star receiver, you have the option to use single base or multi base. These days, we recommend just sticking with single base. If you're running a non H star device like the Nomad or Juno, um, you can it'll be grayed out and you just have the option of single base only. So we just stay with the defaults here processing type automatic, uh, single base provided. I'm going to click on next. The next setting is correct. Settings. I'm going to click on change inside of this window I really don't change anything here as well the data that I process I only want corrected position I don't want the uncorrected data and I automatically use this smart setting Trumbull basically keeps everything for you like it should be the thing I do change from time to time is this recorrect real-time positions and why this is on right here, if I was out in the field collecting data with a sub-meter unit, or let's say a, a sub-foot GO7X, but I'm using WAS, that's a free correction from the FA. My accuracy with that may be 24 inches, but the unit can process down to four inches. So when I bring it back in the office to clean up, I want to recorrect those SBAS positions or WAS positions to get a better accuracy. So we turn this on. Times we don't turn this on is if I was using a real time correction and uh, here in Louisiana, LSU operates a system called GolfNet. In Georgia, there's one called Trimble VRS Now, and in Florida, there's one called FDOT. If you're working in any of those areas and you have internet, you can get up to centimeter level accuracy. So if I was getting centimeter in the field, there would be no reason to recorrect those positions. So that's when you would actually turn that off. But for now, we'll leave this on because I didn't have corrections. We're going to hit OK. These settings, you just do once really, and then once you run it through, you can process the data again fairly quickly. So uh, I'll hit Next, and we'll get to Differential Correction. This one right here, um, this is probably the most important screen. Uh, we're going to start with base data tab here, base provider search. I'm going to click on the select button. And we're presented with a list of base stations. I'm going to put this right here. If you haven't run the software in a while, it's probably a good idea to hit update base list. What it does is it goes out to the internet, the Trimble server, it downloads base station list. Every once in a while, they make changes, they add, remove, and it'll just update this list. Now in my software, sometimes when I update the list, it'll take this window and hide it down on the on the taskbar, so you'll have to come back and, and click it to turn it back up. Um, so just to let you know, sometimes that window will disappear. Last week it disappeared when we did this. Today it didn't do it, but sometimes this window will go away. Uh, well, we'll get that minimized to the toolbar, taskbar. Sorry. And now that we have our base list updated what I recommend it sorts it by distance you can click on any one of these and it sorts just like a spreadsheet uh, but we always recommend going by distance you want the closest base station to you um, integrity index we don't really worry about that anymore so don't worry about the question marks distance is the main thing uh, L2 is big they should almost all have L2 these days G stands for GLONASS. Um, you definitely want a station with GLONASS, even though Trimble's list may be incorrect. I do know that this English Turn station does not have GLONASS. This station does not have GLONASS. So for the most part, uh, I think Trimble's updated their list these days. Okay, so I'm going to highlight this Loyola one um, four miles away. So 
closest one, I'm going to start with that. I'm going to process. If it doesn't work, I'll just go down my list and pick the next station. These stations do go down from time to time, and the data may not always be available. Uh, someone sent me a file the other day. They said they couldn't process. I got it in. I basically went down every station in the list. After a while, it wasn't working, so I switched from Alabama and just picked the station in Louisiana. It still wasn't working. That just From there, I just sent it off to Trimble, and it's just being looked at. But for the most part, if it doesn't process with the first station and you pick another one, it should work. If it doesn't work after that, then the file, after a couple, the file may be uh, corrupted, and that's when you get me involved or any I involved. So I'm just going to click on um, highlight the station, hit OK. It shows up in the list. This next segment here, reference position. Depending on what you select here, you're going to move the data three feet roughly for Florida. I think Florida's 2.6, Georgia, north, northwest Georgia, maybe up around a meter range. These are two different base positions. Um, when we process the data, the data is going to assume the position uh, from this reference position, kind of what it goes off of. So I have a baseless position which is typically in terms of, I'm going to go open this up so y'all can see what the position looks like. Well, this is a bad example because the guy puts the same position in both. Let me try this one. So the tremble, the bottom position is typically in what we call like the old WGS84 slash ITRF2000. The new position here, well, the top position is from the downloaded base files. In this case, anything from NGS, let me change this. I got a Tennessee file here. Anything from NGS, these core stations are going to be in NAD 83-2011. I run on the new data because I want my data to line up. So if you're working in state plane, you can tell it to use reference position from base files. If you're going to be working in latitude, longitude, um, WGS84, then use the bottom one. Uh, if you don't know, you can always ask us. We can help determine which is the best one to use. Another thing, too, is you can use the bottom one, and then when you go to export, so this is in the ITRF 2000 slash WGS84. If I export this out afterwards, I can put it in, let's say I want to go to State Plane NAT 83 2011. I have the option to change that later. So you can use either one. You just need to make sure that you, based on what you choose here, that you uh, pick the right thing on the export. So, really up to y'all how y'all want to do it. I'm not sure what coordinate system all your data goes into. If y'all know, y'all can let me know now um, and I'll process either way, but um, if not, we'll just use the bottom, the default. I usually way. just use the base station. Okay. So that's yeah. What do here. Okay. okay. So, so we'll just stick with that same workflow y'all been doing and then I'll show you how to adjust if you want to put it on the new datum when you export. So that'll be good. So we'll, for, for you all, we'll just stick with the bottom and we will just go with next and start. So what it's going to do now is it's going to go out to the internet, download the files. And I, I had it set to confirm base before proceeding on. And the reason I do that under this coverage details is I want 100% coverage. If it's off, let's say it said 50% coverage, it would only process half the file. And we're telling it to only output corrected data. So half your data would be missing when you go to look at it on the map. So it's very important that you check this coverage details. You want 100%. I'm going to hit confirm. And what it's doing, I'm going to go back to the map here. Uh, and we're going to select this first point. It's, it's basically doing a lot of math. So I shot this point in, started at 940, 
36 seconds, average 12 seconds. At that time, I used each one of these satellites. So what the base station is doing, this processing wizard, is it's going to that base station. It went pretty quick. Um, and it's calculating, okay, at, at that time, satellite 10 from this Loyola base station here, it was showing that that position had this much error in the signal, and it adjusts your position. It does this for each one of those for every second. So basically just a whole lot of math going on in the background. When it's done, it gives you a little report here, and it tells you your accuracies. So in this case, 311 positions were code processed. Code is basically sub-meter. Um, it's not the high-end processing. Code is typically when you get in a tough environment like trees and buildings. I was around trees and stuff when I was shooting some of these points in. Um, my body was blocking my antenna. I didn't have that external antenna at the time. So code processing is typically you'll get 100% on that. Uh, this one below it is carrier processing. Carrier is the one that gets you more or higher accuracy. Uh, in this case, you know, it only got about 80% coverage for carrier. And then sometimes code data is chosen of a carrier depending on how long, um, depending on how, how good the position is. Now, this was a short file. Uh, if I would have had the file open longer, I would have gotten better data. So if you keep a file open longer than like 10 minutes, uh, it, it's logging all this data in the background and it helps to do this carrier processing. And mine was a pretty short file. Um, so that is one thing to consider. Is sometimes that file, uh, you can process a little better if you have a more carrier data. And then here's my accuracies. And this is for all the positions, the 311 positions. This is what it calculates out to. I'm going to close this report. Um, we're going to go back to Pathfinder Office. I'm going to go open my project folder, and you're now going to see here was the raw data, this SSF file, Trimble Field data. Here is the corrected file. It looks like a, it's kind of hard to see, but it's a bullseye icon, and it says Trimble Corrected Data. And then I also have this correct text file. This is the data we were just looking at. So this is our information about processing. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to open both files. Well, we'll just open the correct file for now to look at it. Now, if I click on a point feature, um, you see under my properties, the horizontal precision is now 0.2 feet. Let's change these units now from feet to inches. So 1.9 inches. So it went from 10 feet or 20 feet, I can't remember the original number, and it's processed down to basically centimeter level. Now these are all gonna change depending on where I was at when I was working. This one bumped up to two feet, roughly. These are all gonna change as I'm working depending on the environment I was in and how I collected. I think for the class I was trying to get some stuff done, so I collect some data quickly. Um, let's go look at this one. Let's say this line here, this is just a little stream or something I was just messing around with. Let's say I know that this position is bad, where it makes this little jog up here. I can come over to position properties, and right now I'm in the vertex. If I deleted the feature properties, it would pretty much delete the line. The line's gone. Um, you can go back in the software and hit undelete up here at the top right. So just to let you know. You also have, I didn't show you all this before, um, when we transferred the file for this ATL test, let me get rid of these. For the ATL test, it actually created an SSF file here. I had manually copied the other ones in those corrected ones, that's why I deleted it. Um, these, here's the test file. So when you transfer, it creates a backup in the backup folder, and then it also puts 
second backup of the raw fill data. So you actually have the original file and you have two backup copies. So if I were to actually delete something or delete the whole file from this training folder, you can go back into this folder here, backup and, and get your data back. So I'm gonna actually edit this one. I'm gonna delete the position or the vertex, if you will. And you see that the line kind of cleans up. So let's say I, I know those were wrong, so I want to delete those. I can then hit this little save, the little floppy disk. So you can edit the features a little bit. If you use the erase tool, this one's a little different. I can't, you see here, I could undelete those vertexes. If I use this erase tool on the end here, it's gone. when I do this, it's going to completely remove them, and I have no way to get those back. So the erase tool is a little different. It completely wipes it out the file. So if you use that little eraser, just be careful. Uh, let's see. Yeah, like this one. Let's say these points are no good. So you can kind of come in here and kind of clean up the data a little bit. I would usually have an image. I usually edit my data, honestly. I edit in Esri. So if I had an image, I would load that in. Um, but I usually just edit in Esri. This polygon's a good one. Um, hey, I have a quick I, question. Yep. So when you say Esri, are you using like the online Esri system or are you yeah, are you using it online? Because I usually use like ArcGIS and yep. I could probably, I mean, if this works really well on the online Esri platform, I could try switching to that and playing around with that. So TerraSync doesn't work with ArcGIS online. You know, that'd be Esri Collector or Survey123. But once we're done in here, um, then once we're done processing here in a minute, I'm gonna export it out to shapefile, mm -hmm. and then you can open that up. Then you can open that in Esri, um, and then from there you can do what you want with it. If you push it out to ArcGIS online, or if you, if you can use whichever software after that. So okay. right now I'm just right now I'm just in Pathfinder, preparing the data to send it over to Esri. Um, so okay. it's kind of the in between software. Uh, now I have other softwares that work directly inside of Esri. Um, which mm, I think Carrie, we may come down next year and well, we not may, we will come down next year and show you basically uh, Pathfinder office software that basically runs inside of Esri. So oh, that's cool. the environment you work in. Yeah. But right now the workflow you all have is this one. Um, but, right. but there are others, there are others that will work, but we'll, we'll get into the Esri part here in a minute. Um, so okay. I'm just kind of cleaning the data up before before we go into Ezra. So that's kind of all this is. Um, okay. Some some other little good, good questions. Some other tool here is let's say I want to quickly look at the accuracy of my corrected data. I have this thing under view called layers, and I have a thing called precisions. I can actually turn on uh, this little. It's like a buffer that goes around the accuracy. So anything with a bigger circle, uh, the accuracy is not as good. So you can see right around here, this is an area around some trees, I imagine. But you see how these circles get bigger? You know, the accuracy is better here, but as I'm walking this fake stream here, basically the trees and my street and sidewalk, um, I think this is around a set of trees. Uh, the, the, the circles get bigger. It just means the accuracy is not as good. So if I quickly want to look at the estimated accuracy, uh, this is a way to do that. Now, if I was in Esri, I would open the attribute table and we'd look at it that way. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that later. Um, let's go. Let's go grab. Let's go grab one of these vertexes around here. 131 inches. So, for some reason, in this area, 145 inches. This thing just did not process that data well. Um, let me change the units back. Here.
11 feet. Yeah, so it just that it did not process those positions at all. Um, something happened right there. So that that would be an indicator. Hey, maybe I need to go back and process off a different session. Maybe something happened with that base. So now I'm just going to go grab that same XSS file. We're going to process it again. Now you've know, kind of been through the settings. We just hit next, next, next. Now I don't want to use this university station. Let me go try this one that's 14 miles away. I'm going to pick base station list, start. What it's going to do is it's going to create another corrected file. Um, it's going to call it underscore number one. So we'll give it a second here. Maybe this one will give us a little bit better answer. So you can process the file multiple times. Close. Come over here to open. And now I have one called test underscore one. We can open it up. And we still have a similar issue here. So something happened. Let's see. Yeah, something happened right around this, this particular feature, uh, feature when I was collecting it. I can't remember where that was at. Let's see. Let's select it here. Yeah, it might have been by some trees. We'll check it out on the map in a minute. So that's how you process the data. Um, some other things here under layers. I'm going to turn off the precisions. Um, you can change the symbols around if you want. Uh, let's say I don't like the color of uh, this one right here. Oops. You can change colors around. This is really just for viewing purposes here in this map, but, but you can change the symbols around and stuff. Um, once you're happy with that, the next step is to export out the data. So I'm going to go here to Utilities and Export. And since I made some changes, it's asking, do you want to keep those changes? I'm tell yes. Those changes were basically the colors of the outline there. Um, let me get rid of some of these screens. Declutter a little bit. So now I went to utilities and export. So that brought up this screen. It, it, it already grabbed the file that I had open. Test underscore one. If I want to go back to my original one and go back to the first corrected file. Um, then I ask you, where do you want it to go? The default is my project export location. I'm going to stay with that. And then it says choose an export setup. Now our software has a bunch of samples. So we have uh, some old Arc Info sample configurable ASCII. This will do spreadsheet data, text files, things of that nature. Uh, we have Esri File Geodatabase, Esri Shapefile. We have some other GIS formats. Uh, I have Google Earth. Let me start with Google Earth. Since this one, Google Earth has a lot of settings locked down you can't change. So we're just going to say, uh, I like to make a copy of Trimble samples. So I'm going to say ATL training Google. All right. So the next thing is, I, I basically, when I did that, it goes in the properties tab. So you set this up one time. This is something that you can share within the organization. So each of you all have your own copy of Pathfinder Office. You can share these um, export setups with one another. But we start, we're going to work left to right here. And I'm going to do this for shape file as well. But we're going to start with data. I typically don't change anything in here, but we do have the default is export all features. We do have the option to do uh, new features only, updated features only, all, all kind of different options. But for now, since this was all new data, we're just going to export all features. 
we have a button here for include not in teacher positions. So in our software, we have a thing basically like a breadcrumb trail that you can turn on. If you have that turned on, you have the ability to call not in teacher data. You can export that out. Um, pretty much all this other stuff you really won't ever use. So basically, there's nothing in here you really change. You just want to export out all the data. The second tab is output file. Um, I don't like to output this default. It puts it in the project folder. But if I export out every other day, it overwrites data. And I don't like to overwrite data. So I usually use the second or the third option here. Basically, it creates a folder each time I export. And finally, we have this uh, file attribute path. So here's our photos that we took of this project. Right now, these photos are tied to my computer, and this file path is tied directly to my, my documents folder. If you share this Esri shape file with one of your colleagues or, or whomever, and they go to click on the an arc map, click on the photo, if they don't have access to your computer, they won't be able to view the picture. So what I could do here is, let's say I had, a, we'll just use my C drive as an example. I'm going to create a new folder here called, let's just use this as maybe my server. Let's just say this is my server. I have a picture folder near my server so that everybody can have access to the photos. So what I'm going to do here is choose file path instead of default. I'm going to say a custom folder. And then I would browse. Let's just say that's on my server drive. In this case, it's just going to be my C drive. Let's say these pictures are on my server. It's going to actually move those photos to this new folder here. And it's going to change the file path. So when you click on that shape file, file database or Google file, it'll find the correct um, photo. This bottom thing here, conversion file, this is uh, something written specific to uh, one of our customers in Florida. They have a specific output that they needed to have done, so they, they wrote a custom tool for them. So typically here, just to review, output files, I don't like to write data, so I put it in its own folder. And if I do have photos, that I want others to access or if I have to share that data, I either use a custom folder or just name it to picture name. Oops, yep. All right, attributes. So this is what we call GNSS metadata attributes. So things like uh, how the data was collected, um, the date and time, if I wanna have all that out there, the data file name. This just depends an attribute to my uh, feature that I'm exporting. If I want to know the horizontal precision, the coordinates, and the position, these can all be checked. If I want to know area, perimeter, my length, these are all the extra attributes that you can add on. So I just selected a few in here. Next thing over, the next few tabs for Google you cannot change. So Google is going to be in meters. Um, so we're not going to change anything here. Position filter. Uh, I I don't like sending out data that's not corrected. The default is, is this box here include positions that are uncorrected is not checked. So if you ever try to export out data that hasn't been processed or have a real time correction, you're not going to get anything in your file. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, the second to last tab here is coordinate system. The default, we can't change this in, in the Google Earth export, the KML export. Uh, it's locked down on latitude, longitude. Uh, so we're not going to do anything in here. And then finally, we have KML. You can choose between a KMZ or a KML. You can have it fill in areas or not fill. Let's say I want to fill it in. That's for my area features. They're going to be yellow. All right, I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to hit OK again. I always like to read what's going on here. Uh, 300 positions read, 13 features read, 7 were points, 3 were lines, 3 were areas. 
13 features exported. That's always a good thing. We're, we're going to do it again where we use the uncorrected file and we'll say the same thing, except here at the bottom, it'll say 13 features discarded. So now if I go to my project folder, that's here in the middle, Atlanta Botanical, I'm going to hit the yellow folder. I'm going to go into export. And here's where I told it to create its own folder. It's today's date, 12-9. It's 2 p.m. or 14 military time. The letter A stands for the first file in that hour. And then here's my K and Z file. I'm going to open this up just so y'all can see. And it's going to zoom here to Metairie. And you see the data that I keep. So you see I kind of just zigzagged down the street. Here's where we were having those problems with this high accuracy. This is by a big old uh, oak tree over here. Um, but if I come over here and click on this one, it gives me my information. Basically, everything from photo down is stuff that I had automatically added in. Post process carrier, geo 7x centimeter, date time, horizontal precision. Now, since my numbers were in meters, uh, the precision doesn't, it just shows up as zero meters because it was a centimeter shot. Let's go look over here. I didn't set that up for lines. Here's some photos. I think if I click on it, it opens the photo. But it, in the software for KML, it just puts a little thumbnail image. It would probably open it up. Um, if I hit close, it's going to close Google. Oh, here we go. Back to Google. So that's just kind of a little snippet of the information. So here's all my attributes filled out. The photo. Here's all the metadata we put in there. Um, so that's Google Earth. Next time we go to export out, which we'll do right now. This time utilities export. It's going to remember my last one, ATL training Google. In this case, I'm going to open up the SSF. This is the raw data. It had no, no corrections, no post-processing. When we do this, it should throw an error. Not an error, but should say 13 features discarded because they have no positions. That is because under my properties, let's try it again here. Under my properties, I told it to filter out uncorrected data. So just to show you that again. Open the map. What I mean by filter out, if I select my point feature, status 3D uncorrected, if we go back to export, filter out uncorrected data. So that's why data will be missing if you don't process it. So if I come back in here, export, see I have that second folder, but it's going to have a, it's just going to be a blank file. Let me go get rid of this one soon. See, it's empty. So it still creates the file, it's just an empty file. That is a common problem we get common call. I export out my data and nothing shows up, so that's why. Any questions up to this point, the next step will be showing you shape files. Um, but that, once you set these exports up, it's really quick to get the data over. You set them up once and then pretty much it's good. Okay, so what I'll do, we're going to do this one more time. Facilities export. This time we're going to create a Esri shapefile. 
and we'll just go through all the menus because those will be very similar except for the coordinate system. So here we're going to go Esri shapefile. I'm going to make a copy of this. So new setup. So we already did data. We already did output. I will come and put the pictures in this folder so we can see that in Esri in a minute. Attributes, we had already done some of that. I'll put a couple more. Let's see. Should be good. Units. Okay. So in the previous setup, units were grayed out. In this setup, we have the option to change that. So basically, we're in properties on this third tab unit. Um, it says use current display units. Well, I don't, I like to lock these down. If I get a phone call and someone says, hey, I need this data in meters and I change it there, I may forget about it. So I like to lock these down. I hit change. Um, I'm going to put mine to uh, survey feet. Square feet per acre is the velocity that doesn't really matter anymore. But the, I'm going to use survey feet and square feet. So that's kind of done there. Uh, position filter, we already covered that one. Coordinate system is the main one here. So right now it's in lat long WGS84. Let's say I want this data in the state plane. So I'm going to click on use export coordinate system. I'm going to click on change. Let me get this window cleaned up a little bit. So over here. Okay. So you can kind of see these different menus. So properties, coordinate system tab, I click on change and now I'm over here. So I'm going to click on this system. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. And I have one here called United States State Plane. And I'm in Louisiana South. And this one's set to NAT83 CONUS. So if I wanted to go out to the old datum, I would use this state plane, Louisiana South, NAT83 CONUS. And then I would set my mean sea level up. And to get mean sea level elevations, uh, you need some type of geoid. Uh, the latest one that just came out is geoid 18. Uh, I'm running 12B, which is it's only you know, the new one came out a month ago, so I haven't even tested it. Uh, it's very important if you use state plane that you use, if you don't use feet, this is international feet. Uh, we want to use survey feet for Georgia, for Louisiana, for Florida, and I do the same for my altitude. But it's really important for our coordinate units. There's a, if I chose this one, my data would shift about two feet for state plane coordinates. So just kind of keep that in mind here. So that would be if I want to go out to the state plane using the old NAT83 data. Depending on your version of software that you're running, you may have an option here to select datum, and it may have the option to choose NAD 83 2011. Since I'm running a newer one, I actually have to go over here and come find this one called ITRF. Where did they put it? This one right here. United States ITRF to NAD83. This puts it in the 2011. So I don't expect y'all to know this off the top of your head. So uh, basically, between the two, NAD83 CONUS. In this ITRF 2011, there is a three foot shift roughly. Uh, this is the latest datum, 2011. So I'm going to pick this one in this case so that it kind of lines up better with my imagery in Esri. Plus, I want to be on the newer datum. If you're using lat long, then you would just stick with the lat long export. That's fine. 
if y'all have questions on this, we can look at your data and see how what method to follow the best. In this case, it's going to apply a, what we call a datum transformation when I export from this old WGS84 to this new NAT83 2011. And then finally, we need a projection file. So I'm going to click on this. Um, if you don't have projection files, I have them loaded on my website. You can create them in Esri, though they've made them harder to find in the software, but on NEI's website. I have a quick question. Yep, go ahead. So I, I usually just go ahead and stick with WGS 1984, but okay. um, for for that export file you were in, is it good to go ahead and still change to US survey feet? Uh, if you go, yeah, if you're going, and I'll, I'll do I'll do another export format specific to yours uh, okay. for lat long. But okay. for lat long, it's always meters, unless it's the vertical. So we'll go back and we'll do another one for lat long for you. Um, oh, gotcha. I'll do this one. Yeah, I'll do this one, and then we'll go and change it to the other one. Okay, cool. Thanks. No problem. So before we do that, just to show you, I have a file in here called Esri Projection Files for Pathfinder Office. So you can go and download this. You can extract it. Um, in here, I just have a bunch of projection files common to our territory. So I have one for lat long. Uh, in WJ84, I have one for North American NAT83 lat long. And then I have this state plane south right here. So that's what I'm going to go grab. So I'm going to browse to this file under my uh, downloads. There's your projection files. And I'm going to pick state plane in this example. State plane uh, south. OK. And that's going to lock it down. The last tab, so I basically, I'm setting up this export for State Plain, Louisiana South in 2011, and um, the Esri shape file one doesn't really have anything in it. I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to hit OK to export out that data. Well, in this case, I still have the wrong file open. Let me do that one more time. Utilities export. I'm going to select my corrected file. Now it'll export out of the shape file. That shouldn't happen, let's see. That's weird. I thought I had changed all this. Oh, that's weird. Something happened here. Let me see what happened. Oh, it didn't keep all my stuff that I set. Let me go back and reset a couple of these. Okay. All right, so we'll do one more. I'm going to make a copy of this one. And this one I'll call lat long. And the only thing different here is I'm just going to change the coordinate system to latitude, longitude. See here, the only thing that you can change, the coordinate units are automatically locked to meters. And if you want to keep the altitude unit meters, you could, or you could change the survey feed. So it kind of, lat long is always going to work in that meter um, horizontal measurement. And then I would set that, and then I would go to browse, and then I would pick my WGS84 projection and open. I don't know why that thing's uh, resorting back. 
me have a little bird. All right. Yeah, see, it kept it that high. I have something weird going on there. All right, let's see what happens. Yeah, no so, worries. Thanks for showing me that, though. Yeah, so let's go look at the data here. Um, yeah, I may have, I may go reset that. Something weird happening. Right, data. Yeah, so look, it didn't, it's not putting that data. Oh, here it is. So when it overwrote the, when it just sent out that shape file, it put it in a folder called the, the project file name. So let me go back and show that real quick. Utility export. I usually don't use that third option. Um, for each input file, create an output subfolder of the same name. So in this case, instead of the second option, which for KML, we're fine. It is E for export, the date and the time. You know, and it starts with the letter A, and then if you export again, it'll be B until it switches to the next hour. And then it would be E120915A, et cetera. In the case of this last one, for each input file, create a output of the same name. It named it uh, ATL Training Test, which is the name of the SSF file we have open. Um, and in here, it creates a feature. In this case, I have an area feature. I have two point features and then I have a line feature. So that is export. Um, and you can make as many of these as you want. Uh, these export routines, you can have one for uh, Google if you want to do quick, you can have one for Esri, you can have one for a text file, and you can run them pretty much at the same time, and uh, well, one after another, and um, have them output three different formats. What I'm going to do now is open Esri. We're going to quickly look at your or this exported data so you can see how it looks. And then we'll go over uh, any questions and then kind of see where I'm at as far as the training. We've got about 30 minutes left, so we're doing pretty good. So I'm, uh, I'm running desktop. This is 1071. If I was running my pro version, I could open that as well. But let's just run desktop real quick. So I am going to go to. my file, which is C users, Eric, and it should be my document. Okay. So here is my three or four shape files. I'm going to open them up. Let's add in a background map. We'll kind of look at the data a little bit. All right. At the streets. All right, so the data should show up now. Okay. So I'm just going to open the attribute table. Um, that's interesting. It didn't keep my uh, hold the name. Let to go back and look at that one. All right, I'm going to click on info. So here's my information, and here's the photo. Here's that hyperlink now. This one's going back to my original C users. I got to see what's going on with that uh, file format that I showed, but it's linked to that specific point. Um, let's see what we got here.
no picture on that one. This one has a photo. So you see the photos are now linked to the feature. Uh, to look at that one. Oh, come on. There we go. This one's just, <laughs> sorry, this would be my neighbor's. Uh, oh, no, nope, that's the wrong photo, too. There we go. It's Halloween decoration. <laughs> um, so there we go. Our precision show up. In this case, uh, I had it set to survey feet. So this is about uh, one foot, 0.9 inches. Um, these down here should be a little better. 0.2 feet. This is probably better. 0.1 feet. Just know that these are not open. This one I think is under a tree. 2.2 feet. So that is the data in Esri. Um, shows up where it should. Any any questions on uh, exports from here? I can talk a little bit about Esri if we need. But but basically we took the data from the field, processed it, exported it to a shapefile, and we're now looking at it in ArcGIS desktop. That is pretty much the workflow here. Yeah, so kind of went through a lot of stuff in an hour and a half. Um, we can cover some stuff if we need to make another export. Uh, just let me know what y'all want to look at. <clears throat> that was uh, that was all good from my point of view. Um, I don't know about Jason. Yeah, I don't know if his mic works. I saw him type earlier. Yeah, he was uh, using the chat earlier. But if, if needed, I can show you how to make an export for a text file or a spreadsheet. I mean, that would be one that we could go over. Um, oh, that would be great, thing. actually. Yeah, okay. We can do that real quick then. All right, okay, if, cool. if Jason wants to do anything, we'll check the chat log. So what we'll do is an export for, let's say, a spreadsheet or a text file. So I'm going to go to Utilities Export. Now, that you're, you're going to notice they're all very similar. Um, the only thing that's going to change is the one tab. So I'm going to go down here to sample. It's called Sample Configurable ASCII. Here we go. Sample Configurable ASCII Setup. So we're going to do a new one. Uh, spreadsheets. Okay. So here's where it's a little different. All these other tabs, data we've already been through, output, attributes, units, all this is kind of already set up. So what I'm going to do here is go to configurable ASCII tab. Now they have some generic ones. I think it's called a uh, I must have deleted the generic one. I'm sorry, but there's two in there. One's just like an attribute. I, I, I don't like them. Basically, I just I get rid of them, and I just create a new format. And what I'm going to call this one is just a P N E Z D. And what this stands for is point ID, northing, easting, or you can do longitude, latitude, um, Z for elevation, and then D for description. But you could call it whatever you want. I'm just I'm making a spreadsheet that basically has an ID number, a coordinate, an elevation, and a description, which is basically my attributes. Um, let me go back to this. At the top, you have the option one set of features per file type, or all types in the same set of files. So the way I have it set up now. For each output, previously when we went to shapefile, it created a output for area, 
created an output for RC plant. It created another one for this RI plant. So these are individual versus cluster. And then we have one for waterway. So what this means here under my export, it'll this one right here will do it the way we just saw with the individuals and this other one will put it you know, same type. Here you put your output extension. So if you wanted it a text file, it'd be a TXT. If you wanted XLS, you can type in that. Um, some other file formats, uh, some of our other customer software might be an ASCII file, which is just an old, a very old file format that uh, older softwares bring in. It's just basically a text file. Uh, let's try, a, you could do a CSV. Let's try CSV and see what happens. You can tell to do this for points, lines, and areas. And then we have this thing that says use template as heading. So that'll make my ID column, my coordinate column, my description column. And then you have your separators. So my for file, I'm sorry, my fields format is delimited. I'm using a comma. You could use space, tab, semicolon. We're just going to go comma delimited. Text, I don't like to put the text in quotes. The default is quotes. So I'm just going to say none. And then we have to build our spreadsheet, if you will, or whatever you want to include. So I'm going to start with feature ID. And then I'm going to do latitude, longitude, mean sea level. And then I'm going to do attributes. You can build this thing out to do all kinds of fancy stuff where you can have it start a header and all this stuff. I, I don't need that. I just want a basic spreadsheet. When I hit OK here, it's going to give me a warning message about attributes. I'm just going to hit OK. I'm not going to change anything else in here. I'm just going to hit OK. I will change one thing. So. All right. So now if I go in here, I should have a folder called this. So right here, here's my spreadsheet. So let's start with the plan. So now I have, oops, I don't have to read the meeting. Um, now I have a file with my feature ID. So this is, its ID is basically when it was shot in. So you can see my numbers skip. I must have shot in some other types of uh, features. You know, I shot in a plant and must have did a cluster. And you see here, it kind of skips around. Uh, my latitude, longitude in this case are decimal degrees. Here's my elevations. And then these are my attributes. My photo file path. And then I didn't set up any uh, metadata for the GNSS, but if I did, it would have been back here under photo. So I have that for each file format. So if I opened up waterway, now this is a little bit different. Um, for for line features, you'll see here all these fours. So basically four is its own line, but it's each individual vertex that make up that line. That's the big one that I did in the beginning here. So let's look at the file. That's this big long line. That was the fourth thing I shot in. So each time the direction changes, it logs the vertex in this spreadsheet. That's what each individual one is here. So lines and areas look a little different when it comes to the spreadsheet. So here's the start of line number nine. Here's the end of it. Same with 11. So it's, it's set up a little bit different. That's kind of a uh, spreadsheets. If I wanted to do a text file, it'd just be a different extension. That's all that is. So that is uh that's prior to three main formats that you would use for exporting would be Google Earth, some type of Esri shape file, or this configurable ASCII for text files. That's kind of it on that one. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, cool.
so since we did that one, we did we did transfer, correct, and export. What I'll do next is I'm going to set up what we call a batch processor so that you can see it all done in one shot. So we did them all individually. But what I'm going to do is build this process. It's like a, if you use Esri, if you ever use Model Builder and Esri or Geo Processing Tools, it's kind of the same thing. So what I'll do here is call it ETL train. And what I'm going to do is the first thing it asks is which features do you want, which tools do you want to have in this processing wizard? So I'm going to say, let's do, tra let's do all three. Transfer, process, export. We won't get into the user command. Um, so it does, it's going to go through each one of these. We're going to build it out. So my device type for data transfer is Windows Mobile. Um, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna tell it to select the files manually because I don't want it to do that. And then I'm gonna hit next. And then I'm gonna go through my base station setup. I'm gonna go down. Unfortunately, since it doesn't know where I'm at in the United States, I have to go through this list and find my base station, which can be very. <laughs> you gotta remember the name of it. I think it's. Uh, Cores, Loyola, it was I and I or something. Oh, that one's not too far away. We'll just pick that one. That one's about 30, uh, 40 miles from me. Uh, pick my type. Then I'm going to tell it. To export out as a shape, and we'll do another two to look. Okay, and I'm gonna hit finish, and I'm gonna click on close. Since I already have a project open with that data, I'm gonna do a new project. So now if I hit this batch processor tool, which is here, or the utility, it's going to pop up, and it's going to run. I'm just going to tell it to run, and it's going to connect to the device. I told it which ones I wanted to select. Typically, we set this up and say only transfer things that haven't been transferred yet. We'll do this training test. I'll hit open, and you'll see here it's going to. Transfer, the image is going to go across next. It just basically automates that whole process. And I can take it a step further. We'll talk about that in a second. It's going to run difference of correction. So it downloaded the file, now it's going to process it. It processes it two ways, carrier and post and code process. And then at the end it exports out and it basically tells me everything that went on in this window. If you want to go see, I have an export folder, should only have one thing in it. And there's my file. So it basically takes all three of the steps that we did manually and it automates them and then the data is going to show up like it did. And we can take this a step further to where we can run another tool. There's all my data. I can run another tool called um, sorry, let me find it here. Trimble. I find our office. I have one here called Connection Manager. So I can run this in the background. It's going to pop up this little toolbar on my taskbar here. And I can say Configure. And I can say Anytime a GPS connects, um, run this process. So I'm going to enable monitoring. This, this one's pretty cool. I'm actually going to close this as well. Let me remove all this data. And 
you'll see. So now let's imagine we come in from the field. We plug the GPS in. And what it's going to do is after it connects, I have that thing running in the background, this monitoring agent. Here's it right here. So it's saying, hey, it's detected six files that can be transferred. Now I have it set to automatically for me to select the file. So basically I pick the file I wanted. Open. And it's going to do everything for me in the background. You can take it a next step further and you can automate it where it'll grab only new files. And then you can take it a step further after that and you can write a little model that says uh, load this into Esri and then open Esri up. So you can fully automate this process. So it's just it's just running through again. But you can see Pathfinder is closed. This is all done outside of Pathfinder office. And now if I go look at that folder. Here's my oops, it's the B file. And there's my my um came up. So that is batch processor. It kind of speeds things up. I like to show the long way so you understand what the, you know, the foundation is of the software. And then at the end, you can set this up to where you really don't have to do anything except read the, read the screen and make sure that it actually processed the data and did all that fun stuff. If you don't like this monitoring agent on, you can just tell it to turn off. And that's, that's when it's off. That's really cool. I have a quick question though. Yeah. Um, so the batch just like takes it all the way through until export, right? What's that now? The oh. the batch tool does all of the processing processing all the way through export. Yep. That's what the batch does. Correct. Okay. Um, so what if I have like multiple files that I need to take off of the Tremble from like different mm -hmm. projects. Is there a uh, way to extract all of those at once or would I have to select like each individual project and name them individually and then do that? Yeah, so for batch processor mode, that would, what we just ran through probably wouldn't be good. So like right. for example, Let's say you had data from Florida, mm -hmm. but we set up the batch processor to run in Georgia. That that batch process wouldn't work. What we would do is create a batch for Florida and a batch process for Georgia, or maybe mm -hmm. wherever else y'all work. I don't know if y'all do North Carolina as well, but we would set different ones up. In your case, though, uh, what, what may be easier is just to run the normal method. So, uh, and I, I was just reading here that uh, Jason asked to kind of run through everything again. So let's. Let's start from scratch. So let's say you have a project. Let's say you have several files on your GPS. Um, so I'll, I'll transfer all of mine at once on my handheld. So I'm going to create a new project. Um, <clears throat> test, test projects I have here. You could use an existing project, Jason, if you wanted. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to start a brand new project. Hit OK. So we went out, we collected data. Now I want to bring the data in. I'm going to go to utilities, data transfer. I'm connected to my device. My device is powered on. I want to receive data file. Here's where I would grab my files. In this case, I'll grab a couple extra. So um, Lila, if you, if you had more than one, if you want to transfer everything off, you would just grab everything you want right here and just open transfer off. So it's but the be tricky each thing one is, oh, sorry. The no, tricky no. thing is they would all be named under the same project file, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it would be a little hard to like separate out which specific project they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other option is you just create a new project for each each one that you want. Or you could just transform into one and move them, move them this way. 
Um, oh, okay. You know, I can I can then copy them from here and create another project. It'd probably be mm -hmm. here, so transfer based on the project you want. Um, so that's kind of kind of up to you there how you want to do that. One. So, Okay. Sounds like you want to separate it out. All right. So what I'll do now is we just transferred. So now what I'll do is just grab this training file. We're going to open it up. Um, this is a different one. This must have been. Oh, this is for my training class from my sales team uh, the following day. So this is uh, street data, um, a little bit different stuff. I'll turn on a few windows here. So y'all can see same GPS, but different, same area, just different types of data. So this is like a light pole, um, some water meters, uh, the curb, uh, one's a sidewalk. So I have just a bunch of stuff. Well, actually, that's a water main because it's got material and stuff. So what we're going to do now is we're going to we transfer it. It's more than a day old, so I don't have to worry about the base file being processed too soon so I'm going to click on utilities differential correction and uh, to pop up that screen I have one file in here I'm going to hit next 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 check my base station I'm going to pick this Loyola one everything here is good next start I'm going to sit back it's going to download the file again I have a hundred percent coverage I'm going to hit confirm. It's going to go through everything. At the end of the report, I'll just read it and make sure it's all good. All right. In this case, this one processed uh, 110 positions, 100% code. 100 of them or 90% were carrier processed, 64 code over carrier. And then here's my estimated accuracies. And then I go to utilities export. And then I would pick my export format. Got my corrected file, neitrain.core. I hit OK. It exports out all my data. I can then go to my project folder, go to export, and I have one here. It's a KML of that data that I collected on, I guess that was Friday morning my sales team so it'll be in the same general area just uh, different types of data so in this case I think I took some pictures of maybe there's a hydrant yeah I took a picture of the fire hydrant I didn't fill out any attributes Water meter. I thought I had a hydrant down here. Guess not. Um, so I just took a bunch of points. Um, so that's kind of the workflow from start to end. If I had more than one file, I could export out more than one file at a time. So just to show you that, utilities export. Well, there's only one in this file. I only transferred one, but you could you could browse to multiple files and export out more than once at a time. So that that I hope um, Jason helps from start to finish. Um, that should be about it. Once you once you have it set up, it's really quick. Um, you just find your base. You all have different field locations, so you might have uh, a workflow for Florida versus a workflow for Georgia. Um, as far as base stations. Um, once you process the data, if you have more than one export, you would just go back to this utility and say, all right, I want to now export out. I did a KML, now I want to go to a shapefile. So I change it to shapefile, hit OK. So it'll export out my shapefile. And then I'll say I have one more export that I need for uh, maybe someone else that doesn't use Esri and just needs to see a spreadsheet. So then I could click on my spreadsheet one, hit OK, 
export out that one. And now if I look at my project folder under export, I will have these different, you know, there's my Esri data, here's my spreadsheet data, and then my original Google Earth data. So once it's set up, you can see it's really quick. Well, and then finally, you know, if y'all wanted to use batch processor, you could speed everything up and automate it all. Um, I guess that's kind of running out with like five minutes left. If y'all had any questions, um, so I know it's a long two hours. I think I got everything. You know, Wednesday will be kind of a overview of the first three trainings and specific questions and maybe a little bit of advanced stuff is what we'll cover on a Wednesday. So I don't know, Lila, if you have any questions. Cool. Yeah, I don't have any questions, but I'll look at the uh, stuff from last Monday and Wednesday. And I might I might come back to you with some questions about uh, data dictionaries or something. <laughs> sure, sure. That's yes, fine. Yeah. But thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And um, I'll be joining on Wednesday, so I'll uh, hear awesome. from you again there. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to, and I'll check to see if Jason or anything else. I think he's good. Let's see. Um, yeah, he said he's good. So I'll I'll start when we end the meeting. I'll convert this to a, a um, video. It takes a few hours. I'll post it, um, and then I'll send that over to Carrie, and she'll forward the link to you all um, for for those videos. So, cool. So I'll talk to you all on on, on Wednesday. Perfect. Cool. Thanks, Eric. All right. Appreciate your time. All right. You as well. See you Wednesday. All right. Bye. Bye.